Welcome, welcome. Welcome to another Doing Good in the Hood series by Project Brotherhood. I got some powerful black men with me today. I got my co-host, Dr. Ben Levy, and my uh, another wonderful brother, Dr. Ronald Neal. But let me say this before we start, and we, and we let Dr. Neal introduce himself. I got two important things to say. As a diehard Bears fan, I'm highly disappointed in the pick of Andy Dalton. I just want to let everybody know that, you know, he might be That's the best awesome. quarterback. Right. He might be the best quarterback we ever had since Vince Evans. But I'm highly upset, but I'm still a diehard Bears fan. And the second thing, you know, I want to start acknowledging brothers while they're still around. I want to give them their, their, their medals or their trophies. I don't give flowers to men, but I do acknowledge them. So I want to acknowledge Uche Bird and Andre Moore. These are two young, brilliant black men, man. They like, they keep me on point. If I had to pass the torch to anybody, I'd pass it to those two brothers. So I just want to say that. So before we get started, Dr. Neal, tell us a little bit about yourself, brother. Yes, sir. Let me just uh, say that I'm, I'm delighted to be a part of this uh, this broadcast, and I thank you all for the, the invitation. Uh, who am I? Um, well, I'm, you know, currently I'm an associate professor uh, of religion at Wake Forest University in, in uh, Winston-Salem, North Carolina, and uh, I teach courses on uh, African-American religious studies, courses on religion and gender, uh, and courses on religion and and uh, in politics. Um, I'm the author of a book called Democracy in 21st Century America, Race, Class, Religion, and Region, uh, published by Mercer University, and Pre Mercer University Press um, in 2012. Um, and um, writing, completing a book right now called Beyond Death and Jail, um, um, Black Men um, and Religion. And so that's a little bit about you know who I am. Yeah, I, I forgot to tell you, brother, you know, I, I spent a couple of years traveling back and forth to Winston-Salem doing a project with uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Uh, Melissa Wick Glove of Gramercy Research Group, and she's on okay. the Council for Black Health, so I love Winston-Salem. Okay. I, okay. I just wanted to say that, too. Man. All right, all right. It's, all right. it's, a, nice, it's a nice town. So let's oh, yeah. get started. Dr. Ben Levy, Dr. Neal, feel free to jump in. Let's start it off right. What is black masculinity, if you had to define it? Good, 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 good. Well, I, I was, I, yeah, that's a, uh, so that, that's the question, right? That's the, that's a big um, question that's, that, that, that's open. And, and I would say that, I would say for starts, it's a, uh, a very difficult thing to define. Um, and the reason why I say that is because um, the idea of, you know, black mask or masculinity with, with respect to black men has been has been questioned. It's been interrogated in, in so many ways in light of our history, um, the transatlantic slave trade, um, Jim Crow, and everything you know beyond that. Um, uh, slavery um, put forth the, those who enslaved us, um, enslaved us under this assumption that you know that black men, men who are of African descent, lacked a kind of masculinity you know, or manhood. And I'm, I'm pretty sure you all are familiar with Dr. Thomas J. Curry's um, brilliant, um, stunning, uh, monumental book, The Man Not. And uh, he deals a lot with that. So um, I would just say this is that, you know, black masculinity is something that um, we can understand in terms of context, in terms of time, different periods. Um, it, it's always kind of contingent to what's going on. So it's like we're in the 21st century, um, you know, America is a 2021. So what black masculinity is right now, uh, you know, March 20, March 25th, uh, 2020, 2021 is not quite what it was a hundred years ago. There might be some things that are consistent, you know what I'm saying? But it, it changes with the times. Um, um, so, um, I would just say that just to be more concise, man, uh, you know, it, it deals with a particular population. If we're talking about black men, black men in the United States. And that's the context of my work. You know, I mean, we have a big di diaspora with folks in the Caribbean, South America, the continent of Africa, other places. But 
it's specific to this context, North America. So when I talk about black masculinity, in, you know, in, in particular, we're dealing with the U.S. context, and it's a it's a changing and it's a very complicated thing. Dr. T. Hassan Johnson, you joined us, right? That's got a steel picture, right, brother? <laughs> you weren't no, moving. No, well, well, my, well, not to interrupt, Doctor. Now, I just wanted to introduce yourself and tell us a little about yourself. And the question was, what is black masculinity? And, and, and again, let's focus on what Doctor Neil was saying for American Negroes, you know, brothers here in America. Well, uh, first, uh, thank you for having me. Um, my stillness is whenever the brother speaks, Dr. Neil, you, you got to be quiet. You got to sit still because my brother puts it down. So that's that's what that was. Um, good to meet both of you. Uh, is it Dr. Levy? Is that the proper pronunciation? OK, uh, well, good to meet Ben Levy. Yeah. Ben Levy, I apologize. Uh, and, and Brother Murray, uh, uh, I'm already digging you because of your hat. You already got my respect just on that front. Um, but no, I, it, it, I apologize for coming in. I just came out of class. You said that, that there was a particular question. I didn't get to hear it. Um, what was it? Uh, the definition of, of black masculinity. Oh, OK. Well, um, I think what we're what we're describing is a masculinity that has been in many ways, fraught with a historical uh, 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 challenge, uh, a, a historical assault, if you will, for so long that the the assault itself is tied into the masculinity of the, of the men who have been developing who they are. Uh, in regard to that, I mean, uh, black men in North America responding to a situation, you know, coming from different parts of the continent, being forcibly placed here, and in the midst of all of that, from policy to you know, daily practice uh, have been attacked on every front, economically, individually, uh, you know, so on and so forth. The, the attack against black men has become a part of how we've had to identify ourselves because it's been from cradle to grave. It's been from in the womb onward. There's no way to kind of separate ourselves from it. So in the midst of trying to do so, uh, we've had to grapple with an ongoing assault. Uh, one of the some of the more recent assaults has been not only in terms of especially in the last 70 years, media assaults on how we define ourselves. And we know in the era we live in right now, uh, this is the most widespread, easily accessible media in the history of the human be of human of, of humanity. Right. You, you, you we're seeing media influence come from every which way, shape and form. And we're finding ourselves under assault in ways we never imagined. And in the last 30 years, especially, we've seen this assault on the very idea of masculinity. Masculinity in and of itself has become fraught with uh, ideas about toxicity that, that are implicit. And black men have in many ways been made the face of negative toxicity, the, the face of hypermasculinity. Uh, and and hypermasculinity is treated as if it is a, a part and parcel to uh, be a, a monster or a boogeyman of some sort. Black men have been the face of this arguably since at least the 19th century, but especially by the time you get to the mid 20th century. So when you ask me about what black masculinity is, to me, it is a complex site of intersection between what black men themselves bring to the table, who they actually are, and the attack and response that we've had to engage just to maintain a sense of humanity that we can pass on to our sons and definitely uh, you know, family members to be able to witness to the extent that we can while also grappling with this societal violence on every on on every level, really. Um, so that would be how I would define that. Dr. Ben Levy. Yeah, uh, I concur with uh, with both Dr. Johnson and both uh, both Dr. Neal on this question. And I would add that uh, one of the things we're facing right now in the 21st century, really going back into the 20th and, and, and I'd even agree into the 19th century, perhaps even into the 18th century, is um, the problem of uh, black masculinity uh, being viewed as not only a threat, but because of the perception that black people in general and black men specifically have, you know, are, you know, black people in Western society, in Western European society and, and in the European, Europeanized society here in the United States have always been viewed uh, by uh, whites as a feminine mm -hmm. group of people that need to be 
um, uh, that need to be, you know, overseen by some uh, uh, fatherly, patri uh, patriarchal uh, figure or image. So consequently, when black men have been get, have have been in situations where they have stood up, stood out and been leaders, you know, whether we're talking about Delon's them down there when they had the uh, uh, 1811 uh, German Coast Revolt, which was the largest uh, 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 enslaved African revolt here in the United States, or Denmark VC, or, 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 or Gabriel Prowser, or, you know, Nat Turner, or, or not to mention many, many others that have occurred, especially what happened with the idea of black males uh, in the Western Hemisphere when Toussaint L'Ouverture, Jean-Jacques Dessalines, and uh, Henri Christophe defeated the most powerful nation on earth, that being France to gain their independence and become the second independent nation in the Western Hemisphere. This thing, that event, put a major threat on white Western power that is still with us today. And that very threat uh, that black men could make a change and a difference in the world is very, very important. I heard uh, 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 brother today talk about the fact that, you know, uh, the, the, how uh, our women have been put in the forefront of everything now, you know, how it is a white man to come into your house and uh, go, go walk, walk right past you and go shake your woman's hand. Like you're not even there. And so consequently, uh, that whole uh, emasculation thing, has been, I think, a, a, a problem for a long time because one of the things we know that uh, uh, white Western society does in the United States in particular is that they play the long game. They don't play the short game. They had a plan for us for years and they've been working that plan. And I, and I would add uh, that uh, some of this goes back to uh, the, the Nixon administration when you had Daniel Patrick Moynihan, right? Uh, producing that report that, you know, that perpetuate the idea of the welfare mother and the fact that, you know, uh, you know, they created a problem where the fathers were ended up, ended up being placed out of the home so that they could even survive. So, so there's a whole, um, uh, 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 history of stuff around this idea of taking the black, the, 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 the maleness, the masculinity out of, uh, of black men. And of course, that has you know morphed into a whole lot of crazy stuff today that we we'll probably get around. But but that's kind of what I was what what I, I wanted to contribute right now. So so feel free to jump in, brothers. It's a conversation. It's like it's like we're in a locker room or something. What effect does this have on black men? This this idea that somebody else is uh, defining our masculinity or what it's like to be a man. What effect have you seen or have you noticed? That, that this effect has on us, if any. Yeah, I would, um, just to uh, piggyback on what Dr. Joseph Ben-Levy said, um, we've been infantilized. That's, that's the, 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 the term. We have been reduced to a childlike condition. And, um, and, and, and that happens when you deprive historically, um, you know, our group um, consistently from generation to generation from, from resources, from our ability to participate in, uh, you know, productivity and being a part of economies um, just writ at large and the deliberate effort to keep us undereducated, uh, under-resourced, uh, to over-incarcerate us, to restrict our ability to compete uh, on the global scale, you know, and to, to um, just continue to restrain us. That's the, that's the effect. And what happens, um, you know, over time is that, you know, it, it puts us, you know, behind. It puts us behind other groups. It puts us behind women, okay? Because, uh, you know, women do not, you know, are not contending with the same type of constraints that, that we have to contend with. That's why you have a, that's why you have a gap. And that's why you have this is bifurcation right now, what Dr. Levy alluded to, um, where you have, you know, two separate worlds, you know, black men and black women occupy completely different domains. Um, black women as a group are primarily, you know, they're incorporated. They've been incorporated into society 
They have been uh, privileged with, you know, all sorts of resources that which have allowed them to develop themselves to the point where they're mayors of cities, they're judges, they're, you know, in corporate America, they're in high levels in academia and everything. And, uh, and that incorporation has not happened um, with the bulk of the black, you know, male population. And so when you're not incorporated like that, you know, you're basically left to fend for yourself. You know what I mean? And so, you know, there's some of us, we, we, because we have to fend for ourselves, we are, we are, we resort to, you know, street activities, the underground economy. Some of us have to become entrepreneurs. You know, we have to find alternative means of survival. Um, we have to go through the back doors of the economy, you know what I mean? Or the back streets of the economy just to survive. We have to go to the military. Um, you know, we just have to do, you know, all sorts of, um, you know, other things and take alternative routes that other populations are not compelled to take. And so, you know, in the, in the large schemes of scheme of things, we have been underdeveloped as a population, and that's the major consequence of it. Dr. T, I'm sorry. Yeah, if I can add to that, I agree. Um, I was just going to add, I, I, a lot of my work focuses on how this came about. And, and one of the biggest areas that I choose to focus on is the impact of policy, right? A lot of the underdevelopment we're talking about that's bifurcated the the day to day existence of black men and women is policy based. You know, a lot of things we're talking about from un, from unemployment uh, to, you know, income, you name it. We could talk about entrepreneurship on every level, every measurable uh, means we have of determining the status of any demographic. What black men have suffered from has been policy policy based, most particularly in regard to even if you just focused on incarceration again, policy. But. Here's the thing I really want to emphasize, despite that, not because of any particular type of support, despite that black men are doing better and worse than black women at the same time. Now, why, why do I, I say that? I, I compare us with black women because often we've been told these issues are, are just black realities. You know, when I was coming up, I did several degrees in Africana studies. Everything we were taught was that what the black community faces is we face sim simply because we're black. But then when you start to deal with data and you start to deal with the reality of our existence, you find that there is a vast difference in even just how black men and women tend to live. And when I started to really research that, I realized that a lot of the issues we face are not because we're just black, but in particular because black men are black men. So it's very targeted. Yet, despite that, you have black men uh, who are doing better in certain areas than we ever thought about. Right. If you look at income for employed black men, which is a critical difference. Because we know before the pandemic in 35 major cities, um, you know, black men were unemployed up to 40 and 50 percent, which is unheard of in any other group. So that's where we're we're we're, we're doing worse. And again, that's a product of, a, you know, a, a, a white supremacist institution. But on the, in terms of those employed, black men from age 18 to 65 earn more than black women. So we're on both sides of the, of the dynamic. Right. Despite the obstacles we face. And I want to put that into the discussion, because in the midst of these kinds of attacks that have been levied at black men from the womb, you still have brothers that are going above and beyond expectation and stereotype in ways that they're not credited for. This is why on a weekly basis I do I do my own online show and I have a series I call the sacred black masculine where I talk about black men who are actually going above and beyond. And I think it's necessary because so much of what we've been told about black men eliminates those brothers that have gone above and beyond and achieved despite, not because of any kind of assistance, mm -hmm. most particularly state assistance or in any kind of major form, but in spite of. And I just kind of want to put that on the table. That's that's a very good point, Dr. Hassan. That, that I mean, that was really, really good because I think that you were, were, were making a distinction between uh, and, and sometimes we talk this even in in, in African African kind of studies uh, ideas is this uh, uh, constantly the victim analysis uh, approach to uh, black men rather than looking at the victimizers. Mm -hmm. You know, we rarely do victimizer analysis. You don't have victims without victimizers. And sometimes we need to look at the victimizers. And who are these victimizers? 
these are the people, as you so so well said, who set up policies to ensure that black men in this country can't move forward. I, I, I like to point out the fact that even now during the pandemic, you know, you watch all of these uh, 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 commercials about, you know, people selling bras, stretch pants, socks. I mean, damn, I mean, this is the type of shit that we sell on the corner all the time. But they've got commercial spots on TV and uh, are doing this. But what people don't understand is that we don't necessarily have the type of venture capitalist dollar to ensure that brothers like that, who, who can get out there and do that every day. I mean, every day in any major city, you know, in Chicago, we see the brothers out there selling, you know, hand towels, face towels, socks, you know, what do you need? We got it. But uh, I think a part of that victim victimization uh, uh, process is to say, well, we'll help you, this white guy, this white man, we'll help you sell your socks, bomba. But the brother out here, who is an artist and creative and doing all these types of things, he can get and go down to the to the to the you know the five and dime store or whatever it is and buy him a bundle of socks and then paint them up and make them look all nice and stuff and do all type of art, artist artistry with them can only sell his or, or on the corner, you know. And there's nobody coming along saying, "Look, that's a great idea." You know, how can we do that? We don't have enough of those type of people in our communities because, uh, and again, that's a policy thing. Mm. You know, the policy is, yeah, you, but not you. You see what I'm saying? We'll help you white man, but we ain't helping that black guy over there. We'll even help you black woman, but we're not helping that black man over there because see, you're not a threat to me, black woman. Mm. I don't see you as a threat, but that man, he's a threat to me in all kinds of ways, right? A threat in all kinds of ways. I mean, he I, I perceive him a threat to in terms of my woman, in terms of my male, my masculinity as a white man. You know, we this always been about how do we stop them? You know, all the way back to when they used to be coming off the ships, right? And white women would be standing there looking at the brothers because they ain't got no man at home. So I think I'll take that one. That'll be my toy right there, you know. Like that famous book that sister wrote called uh, uh We Were Her Slaves, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, that they did so so yeah so I, I think that that's that that's really something that we you know we need to uh, 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 think about and yes policy I think is one of the one of the key roles that's happening you know uh, that they're trying to fight. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, as we discuss policy, and I know it's not this simple, but the sake of this time and this conversation, to change policy starts with you know like you said data research and, and having a direct link, a direct communication line with some of our black legislators. I mean, so let's look at uh, the state of Illinois. The Black Caucus probably dominates the state of Illinois in making decisions. What do we need to do as men? Like, is it something we need to do, um, start start putting more pressure on these black and white politicians? Should, should we start, I don't mean enforce, I don't want people to think I'm talking about storming the Capitol on some crazy white stuff, but, do we need to start playing that political game and putting more pressure on these people that we voted for? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just to address some of these policy issues. Yeah, I, I definitely think that, I mean, that has to be done. I mean, we have to look at them not as black politicians, but just look at them as politicians and and treat them as such, you know, and, and, and treat them as people who, you know, who, you know, who are paid politicians, I mean, tax, you know, tax dollars, you know, support them or what have you, and they're voted in and they're voted out. And and what we have to do is we have to change our way of thinking about black people in politics, you know, and Dr. T.S.N. Johnson um, alluded to that in terms of how we have thought about black people, you know, in, in, term, in, a, in a very generic kind of way. And that generic approach to politics is, is outdated. It no longer works. And so we have to have, you know, greater specificity when we talk about you know black men's issues and um and, and, it, and it requires you know at at every level particularly the state level it requires you know organization and an organized front and and it requires you know black men you know putting forward a you know uncompromising you know vision you know of what's going on you know and and, and 
you know, dealing with, um, you know, black boys in schools, K through 12, um, you know, black male youth and what have you. That's a, a serious thing. I mean, it means a lot to to have black men putting pressure on school boards. You know, it means a lot to have black men putting pressure on uh, on the local courts, you know, and uh, and what's going on locally um, with policing and all that. Um, and, and black men being a part of chambers, chambers of commerce, you know, however they're configured across the country and, uh, and ensuring that, you know, when money is coming into cities for development and all that sort of thing, that, you know, that black men in business and others are able to take advantage of that, that contracts, you know, are secured, you know, by black male entrepreneurs. So, um, you know, I think that that, you know, that kind of pressure is definitely something that we have to do is inescapable. And yeah, we can no longer look at black politicians as black politicians. You just look at them as politicians, get rid of this kind of romantic idea that these people who look like us really care about, you know, uh, black communities, because from what we've learned over the past you know, few decades is that these people are really wedded to white interests and white concerns and and we have to understand that and, and and understand that those white concerns don't always trickle down to us you know what i mean and uh and, and that's it we have to or be organized and put pressure on them you know at every level you know i want to i want to add to that because uh brother, brother neil is definitely correct uh one of the things I, I i push for is that we also have to be able to uh, to move based on data as well as uh, construct a plan and any kind of framework. I don't care if you're talking about football or in the military, if there's an engagement, it's uh, action is in def- is definitely important, but strategy for that action is crucial. Otherwise you just got people out there acting, but there has to be strategy. So when I talk about data, uh, we have to let the data help determine what our strategy is. My, you know, brother just mentioned education. That is crucial. You know, especially if you're talking about black boys, we know black boys in terms of reading uh, across the nation by the eighth grade, only 10 percent are literate. Right? And, and as far as math and, and science, you're talking about 12 percent. So we need to develop strategy that directly addresses that. Why? Because it impacts them later. I mean, I teach in the California State University system, which is the largest university system in the country. By the end of their first year, black males drop out at a 70 percent rate. And that was pre-COVID. Right. So we have to be able to have critical dialogues about what the information says so we know how to craft the strategy. One way I've tried to approach the strategy is having conversations with black men online. And one of the things we developed last summer, obviously before the election, was a list of proposed policies that black men themselves crafted. And I put this list on a blog. Uh, it's at newblackmasculinities.wordpress.com. It's a pinned article at the top and it's called the Black Male Political Agenda. And on it, we listed bullet point uh, a series of policies up for discussion. Now, the reason that was important and I think will remain so is I found very few of those uh, prior to that. But more so when I whenever I notice black men being asked, what is it you want? What is it you need? Well, first and foremost, when I notice black women being asked, they had answers. They had answers. They could list out the things they wanted. They could list out the policies they were pushing for. When black men are often asked, what I often hear more often than not are policies that we've been told about that benefit the black community as a whole, but undermine and completely un- ignore the realities of the difference of black male life. And there's not a list of policies that we agree upon as black men that we generally share and put forth. So even when Ice Cube was putting forth his black, his, uh, you know, uh, what is it? Uh, I forgot the term he used for the name of his program, but he was designed for black America as a whole. One, it didn't regard gender. And we know he got attacked on the basis of that because he didn't have a specified place for black women. But nobody imagined that there may be, may be a need for something for black men, even in Ice Cube's report. The, the assumption was that because he was a black male, he had already taken black men into account and we just need to account for the women that he ignored. No, he was trying to speak to black America and I applaud him for his efforts. But there is a need to specify the specific existence of black males in ways that others don't. Nobody really does. And black men ourselves often don't know how to do. So when you actually look at the list we put together, whether you agree with it or not, what you will notice is that it is very specific to black male needs. It is crafted by black males. And if nothing else, you walk away with the, with the sense that, yeah, 
We need to have more conversation amongst black men about what's needed so that when we do engage in political action, we have a plan about what it is we're asking for, what it is we're demanding, what it is we're going to do regardless of their answers. You know what I mean? But we, if we don't have a plan, we just end up kind of agitating for, for an unclear purpose. Can you give us an example of one of those policies? Um, yeah. It, it, can I share my screen? I, I, I'm I'm sure you, I'm not the IT cat. So no, no, let me let me see if they if they'll let me. Uh, let's see. Um, okay. Uh, bear with me a moment. This is uh, here. I'll do it this way. All right. So this is the uh, blackmail political agenda. Again, I said it's on the uh, uh, the a uh, blog that I run. Right, and you can see. A list here of, of issues. The first one on the list is family court reform. Now, why is that important? I mean, we know whether you're talking about child custody, whether you're talking about child support, this has been one of the most debilitating institutions uh, in, uh, in Western society as far as it relates to impacting black men. And there are bullet points underneath it uh, where black men have gone into detail. I didn't write this. This came out of a conversation with 10,000 black men through my uh, my channel on YouTube. So we're having these discussions and black men are pushing forth uh, their ideas. So, you know, uh, from a financial abortion, you know, to um, fi uh, formal child support management reports where there has to be a reporting of how payments are used. Black men are going into detail about mm -hmm. the things that impact them. So that's just family court reform. You got education. Um, hold on, let me just get hold of the scroll bar. We can do this a little faster. There we go. Um, so there are bullet points under that affirmative action specified directly toward black men so that we, we don't get into another situation of double minority, um, you know, kind of a, a situation where, where black men are ignored in a particular way. We got targeted homeless programs because we know as of last year, again, before the pandemic, you know, black America constituted black American homeless constituted half of America's homeless. But what nobody wanted to say beyond that is the majority of that were black men. And in some in, in urban centers in the past 10 to 20 years, uh, the, you know, over 90 percent of the black homeless have been men. Right. Because you're also talking about brothers who are coming out of prison and often even with housing vouchers, nobody will rent to them. So if you go to L.A., for example, and you look at the, the tent cities they have out there, they were all the, the number of black men were ridiculously high. Right. So we know that black male homelessness is high. But again, nobody really talks about it. Uh, unemployment programs. I already talked about the reasons for that in terms of the levels of unemployment, of course, law enforcement uh, and several other bullet points that we could continue to go into uh, intimate partner violence policy, the ways in which, um, you know, we know that, uh, the, you know, black males suffer it in the black community. Abuse is bidirectional. This is coming out of the work of Dr. Tommy Curry that my brother, Dr. Neil mentioned in the man, not he, one of the things he points out with data is that when it comes to abuse in the black community, Men initiating abuse, women initiating abuse. The rates are equal, statistically speaking. Men suffer from it. Women suffer from it. But we don't frame it that way. So men's victimization goes ignored. And policy that, that you know, in, in terms of how people are incarcerated, overwhelmingly punishes black men. Right. So we go into this in here and, and you know, you can go through it yourself. Uh, the targeted cancer campaigning. Black men suffer from cancer in ways that other groups don't, even in the black community. Uh, entrepreneurial support, uh, even though black men are uh, black men actually have 65 percent of the entrepreneurial businesses in our community. But as Brother Ben Levy was pointing out, Dr. Ben Levy, we, we, we don't have the, 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 the wealth. We, wealth is transferred usually through um, inheritance. And in the black community, we have very little. So we're starting businesses from scratch with very little support. And as you have education advancing black women, because since 1976, black men only have about half the degrees black women do. They've been advanced in a way we haven't. So our entrepreneurial businesses are struggling in many ways and nobody's actually investing in them to any great degree. But, you know, so those kind of things need to be addressed. And it goes onward. Paternity leave, uh, voter disenfranchisement, uh, even dealing with reparations, you know, reparations targeted at black men. So, you know, those are just a snippet of some things. And again, like I said, you can dis disagree with it. You can agree with it. That to me is not really the point. To me, the point is at what point do we, uh, do we, do we start to have conversations as black men 
about what it is we need, not necessarily in terms of what the whole black community needs, but really specifically what black men and boys need, because those groups have been severely ignored. That's very, very good. Very good point. Uh, and I was thinking, listen to what you were saying, Dr. T, and, and what came to my mind. Um, I never forget, um, I, I, I was on the committee of one of my students, you know, I was on, on his thesis committee, and he was telling me, uh, since he does a lot of work with politicians, he said, you know, he said, you know, Dr. Ben Levy, he said, you know, politicians vote their interest, not their parties. They vote their interest and not their parties. And I thought that that was a very powerful statement because then it made me begin to pay attention because a, a lot of politicians, as, as Dr. Leo said, you know, we didn't want to talk about black politicians. They're just politicians. And they're working on their interests just like uh, uh, any other politician is doing. And they in there signing these bills. And, you know, I try to introduce my students the idea of pork in the bill, you know, and to ask them, you can go out and find out what your legislative representative in Congress or in the, in the state has put into the bill because all of this is recorded is in the federal regulations. You can go and see these conversations. But if you don't see, you don't know. And then you may discover that your a particular representative is signed on to something that has nothing to do with how it's going to benefit your uh you as his constituent you know i point out that all of these politicians got money for school all of them but like i told them if you don't go because they don't advertise it if you don't go out there and get that money they're gonna give it to their friends their relatives or, or who the hell ever and so uh uh, uh that's one of the, one of the things i thought that was important uh, so they're always working in their own interest because uh, 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 politics, you know, as I've heard many times, is the art of compromise. And even when we go back to the, you know, the uh, uh, Reconstruction and, you know, when they say we had all these black people in Congress, look, they really didn't do a whole hell of a lot for black people. They really did. You know, it was good to have to say historically that we have their faces there. But not all of them accomplished things, and none of and none of and none of them, Doctor Neal, you know, was as radical as a person like Bishop Henry McNeil Turner. You understand? Bishop Turner was somebody. I mean, we don't even talk much about that brother. I mean, he was raised in hell all up in the church, you know, in other places among black ministers who were saying, you know, we don't, no, we can't, we can't buy that, you know, and and but he was speaking truth to power in a way that they were doing. And then there's the question uh, of voter suppression. We see that. Right, Dr. T in our face right now. These white folks right now, I tell, I tell my students, I understand this. If they take away the franchise, which is a part of the, a part and possible of your right to be a citizen. When they take away the franchise, they take away your citizenship. And what does that mean? That's not a good proposition. You know, we don't even want to think about the consequences of them getting away with pulling something off like that. And they can do it. Why, in my judgment, because they have suppressed black masculinity, and, and in many ways suppressed our will to fight. And those of us who are out here fighting, hell, we have to be concerned about the brothers out there who don't even want to get into the fight. I mean, y'all wasting your time, man. That's crazy. So, so, so that's one of the questions. By them suppressing black male identity and masculating us, is it even possible to be toxic? to have that word toxic masculinity. Is that even possible in you guys' eyes? Okay, sorry about that. Yeah. Um, I would say, you know, look, you know, there, there are varying degrees of what people refer to as toxicity. But to me, the most extreme degrees, when you talk about a, a form of toxicity where, where you have men committing acts that you know, require incarceration. When have black men been excused from incarceration? When have black men been excused from being hyper punished well, by the law enforcement uh, institution? I mean, when have you seen that take place? I mean, black men, <clears throat> any hostility we, 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 you know, articulate and we express is, is hyper responded to in many ways by institutions. Now, the more subtle and, and accepted uh, forms and by accepted, I mean, people can commit these acts and they're not necessarily arrestable offenses. These types of toxicities that people refer to in terms of being sexist or or being, uh, you know, dismissive of other, you know, whatever. 
at, at the end of the day, what we find is that black men generally register as one of the most progressive groups and the most progressive groups of men, uh, as well as even fathers and parents. You know, black men tend to participate in their child rearing more than other groups of men. So the, it, it, it's not evidenced that this is pl taking place, but it is evidenced in stereotype. And people are so comfortable with stereotyping black men as being hyper aggressive, hyper, you know, you know, incredibly sexist and patriarchal and so on and so forth. But we've not find found evidence of this historically. But these are tropes that people are comfortable with. And one of the ways you kind of notice that is when you ask people to talk about black male toxicity, what they'll often do is turn to anecdote. They'll turn to anecdote about one person's experience with a black man. And black men are vulnerable in one way more than any other group. We are a group that can be categorized by the acts of 1% of us more than anybody else. Mm -hmm. What one black man does reflects on the entire group more than any other group. Mm -hmm. So our toxicity, if you will, if you listen to people articulate what it is, more often than not, they turn to individual anecdote. Mm -hmm. They don't turn to data much of the time. Because data can actually show us what's going on in the larger frame. People don't want to do that. So what happened to my cousin's sister's uh, distant relative when she got smacked by a guy in public somehow represents black men. And we accept this more often than not. I've seen this accepted at academic conferences as if it's true because of anecdote. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's really, 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 really weird. So who's been... Who's been pushing this agenda on, on, on black men? Has it been just the media? Has it been some of our organizations? I know for a while there was um, with Black Lives Matter, the national movement. They left the black man off their website, out their agenda. So what do we do? How do how do we address that? How do we address that for my little nephews, my little cousins, my little brothers to let them know it's okay to be a man that, that your love wanted and needed when we have so many people attacking us. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I would say we have to acknowledge that it's, it's systemic, you know? It's, it's, it's not just one thing. It's, yes, it is the media, and the, the media is a major purveyor of this idea of, you know, toxic, you know, black men and what have you. Um, but it's not just the media, you know? It's our academic institutions, our higher education. It's also K through 12. Um, it ha it's also includes, you know, religion. Um, it, it includes so, you know, many spheres uh, that participate in this idea that black men are, are just, you know, endless threats. We're endless threats to, you know, some perceived order and what have you. And I mean, and these ideas, the thing about it is that, you know, these, these ideas are just, they're ancient, they go back so many generations and decades, you know what I mean? I mean, you think of, you know, W.E.B. Griffith's, you know, 1915 film, Birth of a Nation. I mean, um, you, you don't have to, they, they didn't use the language of toxic masculinity, but that's what they were trying to describe in that film in terms of, you know, reconstruction and black men, you know? And so, and those ideas in that film came from prior eras and everything. And, and we've just continued to reproduce that over and over and over and over again, and um, you know, and the thing about it is, that it's per, it's pervasive. It's not just particular. Of course, white the white dominant society reproduces these ideas, but um, other people who are shaped by the society, including black people, um, adopt these same ideas and manufacture them and reproduce them over and over again. And and what we have to do, you know, is really fight. It's kind of like you know, do what the Jews did. You know what I'm saying? We you have to look at this, this thing, toxic masculinity or toxic black masculinity, in the ways in which Jews have combated anti-Semitism, okay? And we have to be very serious about defamation, uh, very serious about attacking it. So when you think about Jews and you think about even today, in today's, you know, moment, um, you know, you can't, you know, you, you can't say anything critical about Jews in this society um, without um, being scrutinized by the Jewish lobby or, or any um, offended party that happens to be Jewish, okay? And, uh, you know, you look at, and I just, at, at a very high level, um, Professor Dr. Cornell West, who was in the news recently, at, you know, Harvard, having to leave Harvard and everything and dealing with this tenure situation. And, uh, you know, and 
he didn't have scientific proof on why he was having problems at Harvard, but he's been around long enough to know that his positions on uh, on the state of Israel um, have not been um, welcomed. OK. And so, uh, you know, that is the context for him, you know, leaving Harvard, going to um, to Union, where he is now. I, 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 may, I cite that example to say that Jews are very serious about anti-Semitism and black men have to be serious about uh, uh, misandry, you know, anti-black misandry. Um, and, and we have to be just as vociferous and combative. Um, we have to teach young black men not to accept it. Um, and, and we can't, we can no longer be silent about it. That's why, you know, forums like this are very important. We have social media and technology because we are, um, we are, we are addressing it, you know, for so long, black men, you know, we've had this, um, this code of taking it like a man. Okay. And that you don't say anything and that you're stoic and that you just endure all of this, um, you know, all of this vitriol and all this propaganda. And, and, and we do so to get along with other people. And I mean, today, I mean, we, we're in a different day and, and, and we have to attack it and not be fearful or concerned about who's offended by it. Black women, white people, other groups and what have you. And young black men have to come into, we have to teach them that it is okay for them to push back against these ideas because they have to. Um, because the, these toxic ideas have social consequences. They have economic consequences, political consequences, you know, carceral consequences. Th these are not innocent ideas. You know, these are not innocent ideas, you know, and um, and, and that's what we have to do is 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 um, have a culture, a new black male culture that is no longer tolerant of uh, misandry in the way that Jews do not tolerate anti-Semitism. And, and that's possible. We could definitely speak up. I think one of the differences is the the Jewish community has that power. They have that power where they could say, "Brother West, we don't need you no more." We have to. We have to. Yelling and screaming is cool, especially in an organized, structured fashion. I'm not saying don't do it, but we have to still reach some level where we have some power to dictate some of the rules where there's repercussions, because there's never been repercussions for disrespecting the black man, emasculating the black man. And so at some point, even, even the young bucks, the young bloods, they have to see us do something for them to get energized and motivated to join the struggle. I'm definitely with you. I'm just, I'm running out of ideas of what to, you know. Well, you know, I think that the, in, in talking about this, like, I, I thought about a couple of things. One, um, I'm always big on looking at the origin of ideas. You know, since I like to tell myself, you know, all ideas have an origin. And I think that one of the things that is happening as I as we come through the educational system, starting from, you know, like kindergarten, preschool, whatever, we are being oriented into ideas that are uh, lead to fundamental alienation. They uh, and, and really this goes back to like Hesiod, right? Uh, in Hesiod and works of days in the theogony, you know, this is where there there is alienation between the gods right, the Olympians and the uh, Titans. There is alienation between the gods and men, the men and the women, the men and the children, the women and the children. They, they all at war with one another. There's no complementarianism at all in that. And so consequently, we are taught to be like that so that, you know, there's no, no complementarianism. Everything is opposition, you know? You know, that's what Hobbes talked about. You know, this, the, you know, man in the state of nature is the state of war and every man against their fellow man. And so all these ideas are embedded in a lot of what we get taught in the schools and throughout the curriculum. So consequently, that stuff is fed into us. And then there's the idea uh, the, of individualism, right? Individualism, uh, which uh, grows out of the Enlightenment, was an idea that elites thought about because the average person was out there working uh, uh, to, to help them collectively survive. And as we got conditioned into this idea of individualism by its very nature, it takes us away from thinking about how to work together as a group. And I'm not talking about uh, the idea of, of communism or Marxism, because like I tell people all the time, hell, Marx wasn't even talking to us. You understand? 
we weren't in Marx's uh, 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 worldview and he wasn't talking to us. So, so you know, I don't, I don't go into that, but the fundamental alienation part of it, I think has played a, a role in why there's a stop gap. And the thing is that this is so deeply embedded in our, in, in our subconsciousness that this is, I think, why a lot of our students, our young men, you know, they come to school, they listen to this stuff, you know, where are they in that picture? Where are they? You know what? In February, they they pull out a drawer and f- dust off some Negroes and throw them up on the board and say, these are your heroes. When there are many, many more, like I tell students all the time, they the heroes they give you and the heroes they don't. You know, we know about Frederick Douglass, but we don't know about Martin Robeson Delaney. You know, we don't know about the... Uh, 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 Thomas Cromwell or the people who are part of uh, the, the Negro Academy, you know, they'll, they'll give us Du Bois in sociology, right? But there are a lot of people who are doing work in sociology outside Du Bois. And Du Bois, they don't even they want us to acknowledge, or they don't even want to acknowledge that Du Bois is indeed the founder of sociology in the United States. So, right. so, so Dr. Lee, you know, we, we, we do got to understand, I'm not making excuses. When black men speak up, for the truth, and we're not talking about some crazy talk. They they try to murder us, they try to kill us mentally, physically, castrate our economics and everything. Let me give you an, a, just the stereotypes that we go through as men. So all three of you brothers work for academic institutions. I'm, I'm gonna give you an example of what I go through and ask if you all go through similar things. Oftentimes, you know, they ask Project Brotherhood to come speak or something, you know, keynote speakers, some conference, something. Where we speak don't even matter. I get there, and, and I always get looks. And sometimes it's not even just from, from from white women, but for this example, it's mostly white people. I get there, and, and I mean, the, the same stereotypes. It'll be white women holding their purse as I'm walking in the elevator, if they're passing me in the hallway. First thing, I don't know why they think they're stronger than me. If I want your purse, I can get your purse, white woman. But what that'll do for some black men is that would make them, you know, Small, get smaller. It makes me get bigger because I, I don't have to worry about repercussions for speaking my mind, speaking the truth, and trying to speak by, on behalf of black men. You three brothers work for academic institutions, and I would say personally, I know there's a limit on what you can say and what you could do because the stereotype of your masculinity and the negative images that people have of black men and masculinity is going to limit you. They're not going to let you do certain things or provide you with certain resources to help the cause. Or they're going to stereotype you. Have any of you all faced that or is that tension that you might see or feel? All the time. All the time. Uh, I think, and I I think all of us as academics can can speak to this. So um, I would think uh, and you all can you all can help me uh, let me know if I'm wrong on this. But like in my department, uh, you know, they do all this consolidation now in academia. Right. So, you know, I'm in sociology, but I'm also in African and African-American studies and I teach philosophy. Now, in philosophy, I am the only black male there uh, in uh, the Department of Sociology. I am the only black male. And let me further say, I am the only heterosexual straight black male or male period. Mm -hmm. Two, in African and African American studies, I am the only black male (laughs) who teaches this in these areas, you understand? And so consequently, because of uh, uh, what I share, what I teach, you know, I have been... uh, um, uh, not allowed tenure. All right, and I'm near. I'm damn near near retirement. Give me tenure, despite the fact that you know I published stuff. I've done all these other types of things. Been at this for a long time. Um, uh, there is, um, you know, there was a move to take me. In fact, I was in one place and they gave me tenure, and I ended up having to go into a whole nother school of the university uh, to uh, to to do my work. And so. Um, Yes, that's that's a real big problem. And the fact that because there are so few like me, there's not enough of me to go around to help the other young brothers. As you said, Dr. T, 90 percent of the students who I am in Northeastern Illinois University, the black men 
90% drop out after the first year. The first year. And these are brothers who need support and everything like, you know, like, you know, we all had to have somebody that who was kind of that we could go to and rub shoulders with and hold hands with. That was back when we had, you know, lots of black professors and stuff out there. But now, you know, uh, uh, um, you know, it's rough. But women, and on any given any class I have, I have 30 some odd students. Now, I might have one brother in my class. One brother. I might have uh, 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 two or three sisters out of 30. Everybody else is like Hispanics, Asians, whatever, you know? And, and, and I'm shocked because I have white students who are sitting in my classes in, 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 in you know, my class in Foundations of Africans and Civilizations or in uh, Intro to Afro and African American Studies or in Africans in the, in the Diaspora. And they will be doing better than my black students. Will show up every day in class. I all had one time. student all the time, but I had one student who was one of my students. She's graduated. She told me, Dr. Levy, I have over a hundred books now on the history of black people in America. What? She said, Yeah, every book you bring to class, I buy it. I'm like, damn. And then here, and here I got to pull my black students aside sometimes and say, look, brother, you know. This is important for you, man, to be here to hear what I got to say. You understand? Plus, you got you fail to realize that these white folks are looking at you not showing up. You know, they looking and saying, oh, they ain't showing up. They're not interested. And so, yeah, that gets to be a whole challenge for us uh, in the academy. And yet we're there, I like to think, as examples to the brothers saying, look, if you let me work with you, I'll show you how to how to operate in this system that's already against you the moment you walked in the door. But I can show you how to navigate it so you can get through it. And that, that, is, that is key. That was actually one of the things I was gonna say, you know, because there is a way to have integrity, to be able to speak your mind, to speak from a place of honesty and back it up with research. There is a way to do that as a black male in these institutions. But what often, what I've noticed, what I've observed, it seems to require is mentorship. Because the man, the man who mentored me and introduced me to the field was that kind of man, Dr. William Little, uh, who at one point chaired the National Council for Black Stu uh, Black uh, Studies uh, and was chair of Africana Studies at Dominguez Hills, uh, who has since passed on. But that was the type of mentorship I had. And so I noticed that when I started to mentor young men at Fresno State, and I've been doing so long before, but at Fresno State was the first position that I held full time. So I was able to do it all day. What I noticed is there was a, a transformation in the young men that, that I was able to work with because nobody had done that with them. So one of the keys to being able to be the kind of scholar you, you were referring to, Murray, is, is, to, is to be able to be mentored by men that can show you how to navigate and do so where you can look people in the eye with a straight back and say what you need to say and not worry about the repercussions because you've strategized how to get into the position where you can speak truth to power. And you are, you're also correct about the ways in which we tend to be underfunded. You know, you're definitely correct about that. But if you can see on the screen, I started an Institute for Black Male Studies on November 18th in 2020, you know, during the, the pandemic uh, from, and that's primarily online. Uh, and I fund it myself. And sometimes we got to do that before we can really begin to negotiate how to build it up and bring in more support. But, you know, at the end of the day, the kind of black men that I, I you know, that I find myself in association with are brothers that are not going to be deterred by those kind of in institutional blocks. Um, and so in, in that regard, there is a way to do it. Uh, and there is a way to sleep at night because you are speaking truth and you're not pretending to be something you're not. Um, and, and I think, again, that just requires meeting the right kind of people that can guide you in your uh, in your in your process to becoming whatever it is you're trying to go, go into. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I would, uh, just, I would, quick, I would. just about mentors is a uh, man was a uh, Dr. Jacob Hudson Carruthers. Uh, yeah, Dr. Carruthers was my mentor. Here in Chicago, I mean, that's that man, a bad was, man, that's a yeah, bad man, bad brother boy. Yes, sir. I just want to throw that out there mm -hmm. since we're talking mentors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would just echo everything that you know has already been said about that. Um, you have to devise strategies, you know, 
that you know will enable you to um on the one hand you know you have to satisfy the, the standards of your particular institution and what have you and um you know and do what you have to do to make a living and survive uh but on the other hand you know um you have other commitments that transcend the institution that you want to you know you know juggle and and, and keep alive and everything and that's and a lot of it is, is you know, it's institution specific. So, you know, um, I'm at a private school in the South. It's predominantly white, different demographic. I'm not somewhere, you know, Dr. Tessan Johnson, uh, Dr. Ben Levy are at, you know, state institutions or what have you. And so you have a different dynamic that is there. OK, um, so I teach, you know, predominantly white students. And, uh, I, you know, I just I get black students. Uh, most of them are female. Um, and you know the males that I get up, you know, mainly athletes or what have you. And so, um, I don't get a population of students that um, would readily, you know, become, you know, my mentees or what have you, because they're they're there for all sorts of reasons or what have you. And um, and so, uh, those are part of the limitations, you know. Um, but I would. Also add is that, you know, you have to find other other means, you know, so Dr. Johnson is doing the Institute of Black Male Studies and everything, um, which is, you know, beyond academia, you know, and, uh, you know, and I have a now, you know, recently online presence, you know, because we've, we've, we've recognized that we cannot be limited by um, academia and the constraints of academia and in an age of technology um you know you would be a fool to not maximize technology to extend um you know your knowledge your influence your interests and all this and to, and to open up your audience to have a bigger audience you know i mean dr johnson has or well, fourteen thousand people on his on his youtube you know channel you know so he's talking to them every week you know what i mean you know and that's I mean that's that's huge, you know, and, and the platforms grow, you know what I mean, and uh, and and I have a you know small audience also, which is you know growing, and so um, you know what we're, we're not limited by, and we cannot be limited by um, academia because it really, when it comes down to it, you know these institutions, um, the the logic of these institutions um, does not really accommodate us, never has accommodated us, you know what I mean, and even the idea of of being a professor and being a, a tenured professor, you know, those constructs never had us in mind, uh, you know, when they were put forward. And so, um, you know, we have no other choice but to be renegades, <laughs> you know what I mean, in, in terms of, you know, uh, what we do and, and find, like other black men, you know, black men, and goes go back to what Dr. Johnson was saying about, you know, black men, I call it a black male agency, BMA, um, black males, black men finding um, other means of expressing their will and and creating other avenues. Uh, so when I talk about, you know, you know, you have the kind of a a front door America where people walk into the front door of America. You know, black men go another route. You know what I mean? Uh, it's just unfortunate reality. We take we have the back streets. We have the back doors. We have you know, other roads, country roads, if you want to call them that, you know what I mean? But we still thrive. We still find a way to thrive in doing that. And so, um, you know, those of us who are at this level, you know, we're no different, you know, from that. This is a new lane, what we're doing this evening, having this conversation. This transcends academia. And I've been on other forums, Dr. Johnson, and, and, you know, and it's clear we understand that our work on Black men transcends the classrooms that we teach in. You know, it, it's just it's just that significant, and uh, and we have no we 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 are compelled to do this work the way that we're doing it right now. I just got a quick question. Somebody just sent me a question. I got to throw this out there just to make sure I, I'm saying it right. Uh, what role does this gender neutral push on society have on uh, black male masculinity? If if any, anybody has an opinion. I mean, it, it. I think it, it's a debilitating one because part of what it's based in is is a is a is an idea that masculinity. So what we have is this Victorian idea, really, that femininity is on a pedestal. Femininity is pure and inherently good, 
and masculinity is inherently bad. And part of the logic of what we're seeing in contemporary media and even in gender discourse is that somehow men need to be more like women to be better, right? That we're inherently problematic and we need more inherent femininity that is, in, again, inherently good to improve who we are. And, and, and so when we talk about this idea, this generic sense of gender neutrality, it's to me, it's rooted in, in a, a series of ideas that come out of Europe that, that presuppose, uh, you know, this feminine purity and masculine impurity. And when applied to black America, black men, again, become doubly impure, doubly problematic and thus are in need for even more. So to me, it's highly problematic and it, and it, and it really doesn't allow us to get to issues that I think are more serious and more pertinent that uh, especially impact men. There was an article that was released uh, on The Guardian not long ago, and it was written by Erin Brockovich. So the, the white woman that Julia Roberts played, she actually wrote the article and she talked about a book. It's called Countdown by Shauna Swan. And one of the things this book talks about is, is, and I'll quote it, it says environmental and reproductive epidemiologist uh, writes about the sperm counts in America have dropped 60% since 1973, 60% since 1973. She said, following this trajectory by 2045, we'll be at zero. So while we're having conversations about generic ideas about gender neutrality and toxic masculinity, the impact of environmental pollution, particularly in black neighborhoods across the country, are having a, a, a severe impact on black men, right? And, and they even talk about in this article, the literal shrinking, not only of the testes, not only of the penis, but the sperm virility. So we're having these deflective conversations. We're watching commercials at every turn where you see uh, black women with white men and, and black men as if, the, it, but despite all of that, we're not getting at the conversations that directly impact black male life, mm -hmm. right? We're living in environments that, envi that are toxically polluted, whether you talk, I mean, another recent article pointed out that in, in terms of uh, lead poisoning, that, you know, Chicago is grappling with it in every bit as much as Flint. And that's not limited to Chicago and Flint. It's happening in a variety of places around the country, but we're being, you know, piecemealed this information. So again, we're having these discussions about how we need to undermine and do away with true masculinity and, and question masculinity and tear it apart. And men some, somehow need to be more like women. And yet we don't look at the, the, the impact of the, of what's really impact, you know, it, excuse me. I'm, I'm trying not to cuss. Cause I'm that's all right. I, hey, this this is the brotherhood, man. Do you, brother? Well, this is a safe place for us to be real. Well, I, 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 I might if I don't curse, I'm still every bit as real because to me it's about right. the information. And you know, I right. want these brothers to have the information. I want us to have real conversations, and I get tired of these deflective conversations that are really undermining and 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 their attempts to underdevelop black men, most particularly. And, 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 but they they distract us from, you know, what's really going on. And this is why I was talking earlier about we have to start with the data. I'm not talking just about whatever report came on, whatever charts new. I'm talking about how can we measure real world impact on black folk? And to me, it needs to start with what we can prove rather than what people want to say in the hallway or what stereotype or trend they want to follow online. All those things are distractions to me. What are the real issues that affect black male life? Start there. Mm -hmm. Right. So they, so that new gender neutrality thing to me is a distraction. It's an attempt to undermine. It's an attempt to vilify black masculinity, black men in particular uh, and boys for that matter, because we know by the age of five, they're considered a threat. They're considered to be as being older than they are as young as we know them to be. I mean, I got a 15 year old son that's six foot seven. I don't even want him to leave the house to go to the store because I know how he's seen. Sweetest kid you ever met. But as far as how other people see him, he's a monster. Yeah. Right. That's the re that's the reality of black male life. Mm -hmm. So to me, I want us to stick to what we can what we can prove and advocate for, because otherwise it's, it tends to be a distraction as far as I'm concerned. So yeah. and then and then in addition to that. Um, we have to recognize that a lot of these ideas, you know, these these are ideas made up in classrooms and made up of people's imaginations, um, ideas that have not been tested in the real world. OK. And, and also there are historical conditions that we we live under that make these ideas untenable. So COVID in particular. All right. So we're living right now in the middle of a pandemic, which has transformed, 
you know, the lives of millions of people, okay? And has upended many of the assumptions um, of the kind of gender ideologies that are kind of dominant in the, you know, the popular domain and everything like that. Um, and so, you know, these ideas are not going to be able to stand the test of history and time and human progress. Um, they're just not, you know, people can talk about gender fluidity and gender neutrality and all that kind of, kind of stuff under certain type of historical conditions. All right. People who are comfortable talk about that stuff. People who are middle to upper class who have their needs taken care of can play with these ideas, but they don't constitute the bulk of the human population. OK. And so um, as long as you have people who are hungry, as long as you have men and women who still see themselves as men and women. And yes, in a traditional sense. OK, those are those ideas are not going to be able to um, um, to really, uh, you know, impinge themselves on human beings. So people who talk about gender neutrality, I mean, you just let them it's kind of like people talk about democracy. You've been talking about democracy. How long? Huh? Think about this, man. Amer democracy, American democracy. Come on, man. We, 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 we just got through with Trump and not Joe Biden. Yes. Well, do these people really think, do these people really believe in democracy? All right. So you got to think about gender neutrality and some of these other ideas the same way you would think about an idea like democracy. So, so audience, let me break down just real quick what both these brothers are saying. We shouldn't be worried about what you call yourself, him, her, she, all that. We shouldn't be worried about if you got skinny jeans in your pants now, because the fact is we need an agenda for black men. Black men, black young boys are not getting educated. Some of the resources aren't coming to us. Stop letting them divide us by arguing about who's wearing a dress and who shouldn't wear a dress and who we should like and who we shouldn't like. Because as a society as a whole, until and this is just my opinion, until black men get their rightful place back in society, we all going to be messed up, man. So, I, I, hey, I, I'm happy we're having this conversation. We got about a good 15, 20 minutes left. I do want to I do want to ask you one thing, Dr. Nana, and please, Ben Levy, Brother uh, Johnson, jump in. Now, as a 50-year-old black man, and, and I'm sorry if I just picked you, it's just Okay. Your box, your box is right above mine, so I'm I'm gonna start with you. As a as a 50 year old black man being in this game, and when I mean this game, just the way my family brought me up, of uh, being a black revolutionary, national, whatever you want to call it, just a brother that fights for his people. At some point, man, I'm gonna tell you, I get frustrated and tired. It's like, and I talked to Ben Levy about this a lot. The more knowledge yourself I have. I don't, and I don't want to sound like a pessimist. I want your opinion. I'm getting to the point where I'm getting frustrated. Like, man, it, 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 is this is this white America taking my struggle away? Because I, I just, with all this BS going on, with all these WAP videos and where our people are going, mm -hmm. I don't think we're gonna unite. You know, I don't, I don't think there's gonna be a push to say, yo. Toxic masculinity for black men don't make sense. Mm -hmm. it, it's it, it's taking my fight away. Mm -hmm. What can we, ha, have you had problems with that? And what can we do to address brothers like me? You know, got to yeah. keep the fire going. I would just say that you're not the only one. <laughs> you're not the only one who has you know had those sentiments or who has you know experienced fatigue. It's fatigue, man. You know what I mean? And uh, it's battle fatigue. Um, um, uh, it, it's, it's normal, it's healthy. I, I think that's what it is. And, um, and, and yes, we are living, this particular moment is a very unique and peculiar moment. And if you have those type of sensibilities, if you've been raised and you were, you know, you, you've cultivated those sensibilities in terms of liberation over the course of a lifetime, you know, um, this moment can be very disconcerting, asserting. I've been there, I experienced it, I have my moments or what have you. And and I, I would just say this, um, you know, personally, I, I do think that, yeah, you know, you know, black America is is fractured in a very serious, serious way. 
um, I have questions as to whether or not um, it can be repaired in a way that would propel all black people <laughs> in a singular direction, okay? So, so here's the thing. So black women as a demographic have carved out a singular identity for themselves, all right? They don't see themselves politically, um, you know, in connection to us. They don't see themselves as a political group that has a linked fate with black men. They're the only group, only population of women in this society that see themselves as a separate entity from the group they belong to. Okay, so you don't see that with Latina women, you don't see that with Asian women. Hell, you don't see that with white women, all right? And, and white women have different factions, liberal, conservative, what have you, but you don't see them with an identity marker. Well, we are white women, we are doing A, B, C, and D. So that kind of reality means that black men have no other choice but to assert their self-interest and what have you and to and to revise that's another thing so we have to we have to revise and modify kind of going back to what i was saying about black politics you can no longer see these politicians as black politicians you have to look at them as politicians including the women you look at the women as politicians and and, and then that kind of outlook means that you got to you know drop some old ideas that we've had about politics and liberation and what have you and just um you know, uh, embrace it, you know, for what it is, you know what I mean? And, uh, and, and, and you have to leave so much, there's so much that we have to leave, you know, for history, you know, you're 50, I'm 47. Um, you know, most of us are, you know, we're seasoned men, you know what I'm saying? We're not going to be here. You know, some of us are not going to be here 30, 35 years from now, what have you. And so other generations are going to have to fight this thing. You know what I mean? And we have to use the time that we have left to be most the, the most effective instruments, you know, towards justice, especially uh, in, in relationship to black men, you know, as we can possibly be. So, again, um, what you're dealing with is healthy. It, it's, it's normal. I would think it does something wrong with you if you didn't, you know, recognize that we live in a, we live we're living in a twilight zone, brother. Dr. Ben Levy, Dr. Johnson. Yeah, yeah, I think that uh, you're absolutely right uh, about that, Dr. Neal. I think one of the, you know, we are crisis-oriented kind of people, you know? We are, re we, we are uh, reactors rather than actors. You know, uh, there has to be, we are always motivated by something that was right in our face that we weren't paying attention to, and then when it smacks us down, now we want to try to get up and do something about it. You know, we haven't learned anything about block and parry you know block and parry we haven't learned anything about stick and move you know or to be able to anticipate uh uh an attack before it comes and prepare a defense uh before it it, it hits us you know uh, those types of strategies uh and tactics we tend to wait until we got jumped and we, we tend to wait till the mob comes at us. And then we want to think about how we're going to attack rather than being preemptive and understanding that these are the things, you know, one of, one of the things that, that I find interesting is when, when you study uh, things like the uh, San Domain revolt or the uh, 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 German coast revolt and how them brothers strategize on what they were going to do and how they were going to do it and the time that they took to do it. You know, the first thing that they realized that they had need to do in order to have a successful revolution, they had to get rid of the collaborators. You know, especially in Haiti, but here in the United States, it was what it all it took was one collaborator to shut down our program and get people killed. All right. And we need to think along those lines, you know, that kind of, uh, you know, kind of, uh, I, 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 I kind of think about the warrior spirit. I've been looking at your swords back there on your rack, uh, Dr. T. You know, those are the sheer signs of an individual who is serious in the martial arts. You know? <laughs> and, uh, you know, you know, and I'm feeling you on that because I've, I've been with that for like, you know, going on now 60 years. And so I, you know, and so those are the things you think about. You know, you, you read Sun Tzu, you're reading uh, 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 um, 
uh, you know, the, 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 the you know, 22 stratagem and all these other types of things that are very, very important in understanding tactics and strategies. And you study, uh, uh, study war so that you don't have to go to war. You understand? Uh, and so one of the things that I think is important uh, relative to that is we have to do, you know, my, my mentor, Dr. Jacob Carruthers, wrote a very, very interesting book he called Intellectual Warfare. And the battles are won in the mind before they're won on the battlefield. And see, we always think about jumping on the battlefield, whatever we get. We haven't thought about the strategy of winning the war of the mind. Because if you win the war of the mind, because the people that we're talking about going to war with, they're a bunch of punks. They're cowards. And they use that fear tactic that they have as a strategy against us to uh, subjugate us. So, you know, I think that, you know, in the ways that we do those things and, and, and we prepare, like, you know, like, you know, things we've been doing for, you know, ages. I've been a member of the, K the Kemetic Institute since its founding, you know, as these organizations and the Association for the Study of Classical African Civilizations, ASCAC, and all of that. And I just got a part of another one called the William Leo Hansberry Society. And look here. They are a group of brothers who are black archaeologists digging and training other young scholars to go and dig up our past in the Nile Valley, man. It's amazing. But of course, you know, stuff like that doesn't get me press. All right. So, so I, you know, in, including, I just like to say that, uh, you know, I like to think that uh, along with you brothers that I'm out here trying to raise up some young future intellectual warriors and some real warriors, you know, who can, who can do battle. Uh, because as long as you think you're a woman, you're not going to do battle with some other men. You know, so that's my that's my take. So so as we get ready to almost wrap up, let me throw this out there and get, try to end off some, some good vibes. What are some things we could do to help push this agenda, to help push these things that we're talking about? Teaching brothers how to network, about mentorship, about knowledge itself. Is it getting more um, celebrities involved? Uh, speaking on each other's platforms because I think, you know, what are some things we could do to get this out here uh, about yeah. black, just for young black males and our specific need for a black male agenda? Well, I think, I, look, I think technology is key. And I think Dr. Neil was pointing to this earlier. It's going to be key in, in what we do. I mean, I remember making my first cell phone call in 1996. I remember and talking to someone on the other side of the country on the freeway and I'm sitting in a, in a dorm and I remember being blown away by that. And now we're at a point where you can drop something into an app and people all around the world are responding to it. So you, there's to avoid that would be, would be folly. So we got to take advantage of it. But the core of it, what I, in terms of what I would say is that every time a black man speaks unapologetically with authority, with truth, and who's able to back up what he's saying, you give license to other black men to do the same. And I think if we can begin or really push that tradition, I, don't, I shouldn't say begin, if we can continue it, but push it to another level where, as you said, Murray, Brother Murray, we actually push toward uh, not only sharing uh, information, not only consolidating, working together, but actually organizing, right? Uh, I think that can be a powerful tool to exciting, you know, black male mobilization. It needs to happen, but we have to be, we have to be able to do so without going to war with one another. And one of the things I notice is that we get, I mean, even, even in universities, man, it gets damn near like gang warfare in terms of which ideas you're down with. You know, are you a Marxist? Are you a liberal? Are you, a, you know, there's all of these, you know, it, it comes down to a damn war. And I'm like, we're such a small population. You got less than what? 5,000 black men who are tenured across the entire damn country. We don't have time to be going to war with one another. We can disagree, but surely we have to at least be able to agree on the base level that where black men are and boys for that matter needs to be improved. So if we can build on just that base level, give, give each other the authority, the authority to speak truth by doing so and focusing on how we can collaborate and build together, there's got to be able to produce some serious changes. We've done it in the past. There's no reason we can't continue to do it, but we do recognize there is an agenda and a plan at work to undermine black male agency. And I and and I shout out, you know, Dr. Neal in pushing that. But it's important that we recognize that agenda. COINTELPRO wasn't in a vacuum. It was part of a continuum of institutions and agencies and practices that were designed to undermine undermine black mobilization and particularly 
See, nobody talks about it from this vantage point, particularly by aiming at black men. Now, that's not to say Pro and other such organizations, other such uh, engagement didn't, you know, engage black women. I'm not saying that. But overwhelmingly, when we look back historically, the target has been black males. And we're not allowed to say that in polite conversation. Right. That's considered politically uncouth. It's not it's not considered acceptable. So we dance around it. We use just generic terms. But the reality is it's been black males that have been sought after, that's been attacked, that's been undermined in ways that other groups, including in our own community, don't experience. And we need to be able to say that unapologetically because black women have been pointing out their particular experiences for decades now. And we've learned to tip our hat to it. We've learned to de defer to it, to you know seem progressive or whatever it is. And that's all well and good. But at what point do we begin to talk about our experiences as black men? And to what point do we, we begin to point out the ways that Black men experience things that we shouldn't. I mean, look, five years ago when Michael Brown was killed, right? One of the things I witnessed was the appropriation of black struggle by a primarily black female led uh, organization. And one of the things I noticed they did was they capitalized on black male death and then turned around and told black men they couldn't hold positions of leadership in the organization. When do we talk about that? And if we can't talk about that, how the hell are we supposed to move to the next level of black political mobilization when Goldman Sachs, Visa, uh, um, MasterCard and Google start investing in black women with material dollars? And why are they investing? Because last year you had black women on the cover of Time.com and white institutions like Time were telling us that black women were the pulse of the nation and they were going to save us. How did they get to that point? Because they were advocating for dead black men, but dead black men that weren't allowed to to speak beyond being pictured dead. So living black men had to sit in silence in the background and follow Right, this agenda. We have to be able to directly smash by speaking truth to power within the community and outside of it and doing so unapologetically, thus licensing other black men to do the same. And that way, when we come to the table to talk about what needs to happen next, we're able to do so from a floor of honesty and not in terms of uh, capitulating and deferring to these 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 powerful interests that we really that really work to undermine us. We got to be able to do that. So I hope brothers do. Very good. I, I definitely agree, Doctor Nell. Did you want to add something? No, I I I, I concur with everything what uh, Doctor Johnson uh, just said. Um, we have to be vociferous you know, and unapologetic and, and not, you know, be concerned about who was offended and the consequences. And, and I have to say, I mean, with technology, we, we, we cannot undervalue the power that we have at our fingertips with this technology, okay? And, and we see what, what it does in the, in the real world every single day, okay? And black men, here's the beauty, black men right now are talking to each other. Black men are talking to each other. We're talking to each other. You see, I, I couldn't have imagined this type of conversation 20 years ago, okay? And, and, and the connection that it took to make this conversation um, happen, you know? Um, and, and so, I mean, a, as the technology grows and develops, our ability to communicate will continue to evolve and, uh, and it will further enhance you know what we do. I mean, our voices are out there, so we're we're not at a complete at a complete deficit. And, and I think Dr. Johnson is right. Is that you know when when young black men, or just all black other black men, just see um, black men as individuals or as as groups or what have you, when they see an uncompromising black male perspective in the public domain um, addressing um, you know, black male interests, okay, they will follow suit, okay? And the world, the world, um, you know, will take notice of it. And, uh, and, we, and, and, and and the thing about that is that we have to transcend this place where we're fearful of what happened in the past. We know about, you know, the shutdowns of the government and all that. Um, but at this point, at this point, we have to, we have to be willing you know, to make the type of sacrifices needed to to get our our, our interest um, addressed, and, and after what has happened over the past several years, with our bodies being used for other people's interest, I think that you know, black men have um, a vested stake 
in, in articulating, um, you know, the, the, the interests, the needs and concerns of, of, of black men. And so um, I think as, as long as we continue to do this and have these conversations and generate ideas that, that we will see things happen in real time. Mm -hmm. Well, well oh, go ahead, Billy. No, I was going to say, yeah, and I think this is important. And uh, one of the things that uh, is, is real clear uh, in, in terms of our struggle right now and in the, in the suppression of black men, in particular, our right to vote and all these other types of things, is this thing that they call disaster capitalism. You know, and how that's playing a role all over on us, and and, and the and the pandemic is really helping to push that. Uh, and, uh, and we're gonna look up when this thing is. Oh, our communities are gonna be different. There's gonna be a whole lot of stuff that is going on. We gonna like, damn, where the hell did that happen? You know, Marx and I, we know that we can see it happening in our own community right now. You know, uh, and uh, uh, so. I, and I think in, it, it pays for us to be more and more conscious of these events and what's going on and that we talk to each other like this because this is the start. Well, well, I will say this, man. I'm excited. I, I, I'm happy to, to, to hear all the brothers that are from Chicago that are unapologetically black men and not ashamed to admit it and tell the truth. And I will say this, knowing, knowing how we speak already as we get ready to wrap up this show, the fans are on all of us, brother. The fans already know we exist. So let me tell Dr. Uh, Bill and Dr. Hassan Johnson, whatever you brothers need from me and my network, and I got a network around the country, If you, uh, Brother Johnson, if you want to do some research to get some of this data from black men, you know what I'm saying? Research for black men, from black men. We can talk, Dr. Neal, whatever you need, brother. Let's do this. Let's create that network and that more unified voice. You know, I got a couple of brothers that are definitely be spooks to sat at the door. We, we don't need to say that name online. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, let's build this network. And I'm just going around for Claude. And, and thank you, too, for coming on. But I'm going to go around to each one of you all and just, you know, your closing thoughts. We'll start with you, brother Dale. Yeah. Well, let me just say, I'm, I'm, again, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that I was a part of this conversation, man. And uh, you know, anytime I have the opportunity to talk to to brothers who are, you know, um, doing this type of work, man, I, I, I jump on it. So I, I'm glad that um, I got to, you know, inter you know, meet uh, yourself and, um, and Dr. Joseph Ben Levy. I, I think, you know, brother Murray, brother uh, Andre. Um, for inviting me to be a part of it. And I'm glad always to see my, my colleague, Dr. T.S.R. Johnson, um, and to be, you know, part of forums with him and everything. So, um, and this has been a great experience. And yeah, man, I look forward to, you know, an on, ongoing, you know, um, connection with, with, um, with the brotherhood. Well, yeah, I would say that uh, um, you know it's, it's it's been a pleasure, you know, uh, and always a pleasure whenever I, I get to do things with 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 uh, brother Marcus Murray, and uh, and I get a chance to meet other uh, brothers who are what uh, uh, the late Dr. Asa Hillier will refer to as intellectual maroons, you know, <laughs> intellectual maroons who are out here uh, outside of the. Uh, um, of the established community, but yet organizing uh, uh, the black community for um, for uh, you know chances to uplift and uh, change you know change the the paradigm as it were uh, to do stuff. So so uh, I'm always honored and always good to meet other brothers. Uh, like yourself, Dr. Neil, like yourself, Dr. T. Hassan Johnson, who are uh, doing stuff, you know what I mean? And I'm sure that a part of, of, of what, you know, your discipline and order and, and everything is about also has its foundations in, you know, martial arts, because that plays a major role uh, for me in uh, developing how I think about things, how I operate with things. And that, and that whole thing about when I was faced with all my challenges, I would always go back to what my, you know, what, what, uh, what my instructors taught me, you know, about perseverance and not giving up, you know, and fight. Uh, and then also, hey, you know, it's not about physical fighting, it's about intellectual fighting. How do you win the war before you have to, you know, uh, use your weapons, you know, your, your martial skills? And uh, uh, and I think that part of what we're doing right here is a manifestation of that. And, and, and you know, I'm honored. So thank you very much. 
Well, I can definitely say I, I much appreciate being and invite being invited here. I enjoyed being on the panel. Uh, it's good to meet you, uh, Brother Murray, Dr. Ben Le Levy. Uh, it's always good to be on a panel with my brother, Dr. Neil, because I'm a fan of that brother's work. So uh, I'm always appreciative when I can when I can look up and see him on there. Um, I also want to shout out Brother Andre. I appreciate his uh, his work getting me in here. I enjoyed it. But listen to the thing that the, the scholars that I've been drawn to. And I'm going to take that term intellectual maroons because I'm digging that, <laughs> you know, and, and, you know, because I always did, you know, identify it as a renegade kind of kind of dynamic. And those are the brothers I'm drawn to. Those are the brothers that I tend to notice come to me. And you can you can you know, you can see them. You know what I mean? These are the brothers that are are, are strategizing and operating, but they're often operating by themselves in silos, you know, uh, without very much support. And they're nevertheless handling their business. I would love to see that collective of brothers come together and really begin to put it down. And one way uh, I hope people would contribute is to go to that that article I put up uh, for the Black Male Political Agenda. It's on the uh, the URL is newblackmasculinities.wordpress.com. It's the pinned article at the top. Please make suggestions on what you know you would add to that list. You know what else should black men uh, be be pushing for and share it. Not, you know, not just every electoral season, but, you know, a, a, across the board, share it so that black men can begin to articulate a politic uh, that addresses their their granular needs and their major, you know, their law, their, their macro needs. We need to be able to have these these conversations and be uh, very clear about what our agendas are, regardless of who it frustrates, who it pisses off. It doesn't matter. We need to be able to articulate it and, and up to date. In my assessment, we haven't been able to. So again, thank you, brothers. I appreciate being invited, uh, and 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 I hope to uh, see you guys support the Institute for Black Male Studies. You can go to the Institute for Black Male Studies dot com. Uh, support that as well. The Onyx Report uh, you can find on YouTube. Uh, come in and support that. Support Dr. Ronald uh, Ronald Neal's channel on on uh, YouTube. Get into his work. Purchase his book. Uh, let's support each other and push the agenda. Push the conversation. Let's not stay isolated in ideological silos. Let's not, you know, engage in this intellectual gang warfare. Let's come together at least with the base agreement that the quality of life for black men and boys needs to improve. Let's start with that. And I think that's something we can all agree on. So once again, this is a beautiful conversation with strong black men brought to you by Project Brotherhood and YHP. And I want to thank our guests, and I want to thank you too, Dre. Until the next time, brothers, let's stay strong. Thanks, Dre. All right. Thanks, Dre.